Kindness is important. It is at the very heart of our ability to generate well-being and the power for change. Drawing attention to our experience of kindness has the potential to disrupt the way that we think about society, to change both what we do and how we do it. Some studies have found that those with strong social connections are the happiest and healthiest, which should automatically put kindness at the forefront of the minds of all of us. Yet despite living in an increasingly digitally connected world, we're in the midst of a globally reported loneliness epidemic. In recent studies, we've begun to explore the impacts, both good and bad, of social media. More and more of us are connecting on more and more social media sites, leaving less time for real-world interactions and connections. At the same time, we know that despite this increase in digital connectedness, we're finding it harder than ever to develop and maintain meaningful relationships. If you've ever felt lonely, you're not alone. Feeling disconnected, segregated and lonely is, is becoming more and more of a common problem. Loneliness is harming our society. It's a greater detriment to our health than smoking, obesity and high blood pressure. Of course, the perfect antidote to loneliness is indeed human connection. So why do we find it so hard to connect? What if kindness was the answer to the problem that we have in front of us? I want to take you back to a time in my life. I think it's relevant to you as the youth of today because I was sitting in an assembly hall just like you are. I would have been that kid that was really highly distracted because I would have been dreaming about my first love. It was cricket. <laughs> I had big dreams, you see. I wanted to represent my country. I wanted to play cricket for Australia. I had two really big problems with a goal that big and ambitious. The first is that I had no idea there was an Australian women's team, which would have presented all sorts of issues, as you can imagine. The second problem that I had was that I was absolutely terrible at playing cricket. What I lacked in skill, I made up for with strong, with strong hard work, grit and determination. See, mum and dad thought I was awesome, but the coaches and the selectors kept saying to me, Kath, give up, you're never gonna make it. But that taught me something, and that is that when you put your mind to something, anything's possible. Fast forward a few more years and countless hours of training and hard work, I debuted for the New South Wales Breakers, scoring 56 in a player of the match performance. Little did I know that my life was about to change forever in a very big way. I broke my back playing cricket, four games into my professional career. It was very sudden and tragic. I was airlifted to the nearest hospital and I had the first of five completely unsuccessful surgeries. It was there that I was told that I was paralysed and that I would never ever walk again. A series of post-surgical complications saw me come within hours of having my left leg amputated. This is still it, thankfully it was saved, it's still attached. But it landed me in rehab as a full-time patient in 2012. My idea of connection in rehab was very different to what I'd experienced prior to arriving. Suddenly as a fit 23-year-old who'd only ever really cared about cricket, here I was surrounded by the elderly and my best friends became these two. The guy on the, right, on the left was an 85-year-old war veteran by the name of Attila. He had bullet holes in his back and he showed them to me almost on a daily basis. The woman on the right was Daisy. Her name wasn't actually Daisy. I called her Daisy because she called me Alice. She had suffered from dementia and actually thought that I was her granddaughter who was of a similar age to me. Rather than shying away from her, she became my best mate in rehab for the next 12 months. What both of these people taught me is that connection should have no age barrier. They also taught me about the power of perspective, which I've learned is one of the most powerful ingredients to finding and maintaining human connection. In order for connection and kindness to exist, we have to allow ourselves to be seen. We also have to allow ourselves to be vulnerable. I think the same thing applies to love. And thankfully for me, I'm lucky enough to feature in one of my most favorite love stories to date. Four weeks into my stay, at rehab, my luck changed in the most magical way when I met and fell in love with a fellow patient by the name of Jim. Jim and I were normal young kids in love, but instead of long walks on the beach, we did wheelchair races in the corridor. What made our time in rehab more bearable, um, I guess in, in comparison to the full white wall environment that we'd found ourselves in, was dreaming of a life that would exist outside of that full white wall environment. We made plans, four kids, three boys and a girl, just like my family, a house in Broadwater on the Gold Coast, pet turtles, and a dog named Saf. We dreamt often, 
and like I never, ever have before. The 13th of November, 2012, is a day that I'll never, ever forget. That's the day that Jim passed away. It was suicide, and it absolutely crushed me beyond belief. Time changed for me that day. You know when you're having one of those days where nothing seems to go right? It could be the, the traffic, the weather, the dishes in the sink, the homework that just keeps piling up. I was praying for those small, insignificant moments to matter to me. Because at that moment, when I look back on that moment, all I remember feeling was absolutely numb and like nothing could ever matter to me again. I mean, what was out there that could possibly make me happy? First, I lost the ability to play cricket, the game that I still love. And, I, and then I lost the person who taught me that there was so much more to life than hitting a ball around a park. I hit rock bottom, and I learned a few things at rock bottom, some of which I'll share with you today. The first thing I learned is that there's only one way to go when you're that low, and that way is up. This, the other things that I learned, which I think are really key and vital to finding connection and well-being, are these. I had gratitude. I was thankful for the experiences that I'd been through up until that point in my life. I had loved and lost, but as the old saying goes, it's better to have loved and lost than to have never loved at all. I was also grateful for the people in my life who had shown up for me, friends, family, and also the random strangers who saw my struggle and cared to help. I had perspective. I knew that as tough as the experiences that I was going through were, that one day I'd be able to look back on that time from a place of happiness and that those moments of pain would not last forever. I accepted myself. I understood my strengths and my weaknesses, and I was re realistic yet subjective of my talents, capabilities, and general worth. When we can accept ourselves and our strengths and weaknesses, we can accept and understand that nobody on this earth is perfect, and that our flaws are what make us different. I had compassion towards myself and others via empathy, because if we are not kind to ourselves first, then we cannot possibly be kind to others, and that's a fact. I was authentic. I believed that what made me, me, made me beautiful and strong. Not beautiful in the fact that I was on the cover of Vogue magazine or anything like that, but beautiful in the sense that the world is made up of over eight billion people. And every single one of us is beautiful because we are different. And different is okay, because if we were all the same, the world would be a terribly boring place. And I think the same applies to connection. Because without perspective, gratitude, self-acceptance, compassion, and authenticity, then we, cannot be, then we cannot possibly achieve connection with ourselves and others. And there's no greater form of kindness than connection, in my view. Realising at that moment in time was driven, uh, that my recovery at that point in time was driven by the kindness of others. And how I can articulate that is by a very short story. When you're in a wheelchair like I have been, you can't reach the lift button, and a random stranger walks past and they see that struggle and they press that button for you, like it meant absolutely nothing to their day, but it meant everything to yours. Those moments really stood out to me. So I just committed my life at that moment in time to paying it forward in any way I could via an idea that I had that is now known as the Kindness Factory. I bought strangers petrol, dinner for the homeless, wheelchairs for kids in need. I raised close to $300,000 and broke a world record for the most amount of burpees in a day um, for, for Mel, a double leg amputee who had helped me in my time of need. I realised that kindness was the catalyst for me finding purpose again, for me finding a life that would ultimately matter to me, and I wouldn't have been able to do that without connecting with people via kindness. Slowly I began to get really fit again, and so I ventured into the world of competitive triathlon. I still have and had then no feeling in my left leg, but that small detail didn't stop me. I got so good at triathlons that I signed up to compete in Australia's Port Macquarie Ironman in May 2016. Training's on track, I was the fittest I've ever been in my life, and I'm on a training bike ride with my two best mates in Sydney's Northern Beaches. I began to make a planned right turn, and then suddenly everything just went black. I got hit by a four-wheel drive from behind, and I broke my back again, this time in four places, I shattered my left hip, I dislocated my neck, and I broke my wrist. The worst part, though, waking up to the news that I was paralysed and told that I would never walk again for the second time in my life. Can you imagine being told that twice? Sorry, Kath, but you're never going to walk again. Dreams are over, all gone. Every single part of me wanted to give up. The way I saw it, though, was that I was faced with two options, to give up or to get going. 
I taught myself how to walk again in only six months, and it was then that I decided that the world is changed by your example and not by your opinion. I asked myself the question, could one person survive off of kindness alone? And in August 2016, I tested that theory when I set off on a journey. No cash, no credit card, no food, no water. I left my home in Sydney with nothing but the clothes on my back in the hope of proving to the world that kindness still exists. I travelled for over two months to every single state in Australia with over 10,000 people offering to help me. I fed the homeless and I was fed by the homeless. I stayed in boats, tents, five-star accommodation. I learned that the world has a habit of showing up if you ask it to, and you can, in fact, survive off of kindness. But the journey wasn't about me. I learned that the journey was about something so much deeper than me and my story. The journey was about human connection, which I've learned is the energy that exists between people when they feel seen, heard, and valued, and when they can give and receive without judgment. I came back and my inboxes were flooded from people all over the world sharing with me their acts of kindness. So I flipped the website, which at that point in time was about me, and I made it all about others and set a goal to achieve one million acts of kindness. That was all I ever wanted to do. As I stand here today, I'm really proud to let you know that we've just clicked over two million acts of kindness. And every single one of those acts has been a connection held between at least two people and has potentially saved the lives of thousands around the world. From strangers buying each other coffee, thousands of blood donations, and even someone donating a kidney on our platform. We've truly seen it all. Kindness does not exist without connection, and positive human connection does not exist without kindness. My story is one that's been told many times in many countries to many different people. But there's no one more important for me to tell it to than to you guys today, as the youth of today. At Kindness Factory, we're on a mission to make the world a kinder place, and we need you, as the youth of today, to make that happen. So this is your open invitation to change the world for good via a generational shift at the Kindness curriculum. The most important thing that I have done in my short time on this earth is to launch the Kindness curriculum in partnership with my friends at Kaplan. It teaches the basic yet essential ingredients to kindness, well-being, connection, and resilience. I would not be here today without those 12 building blocks. And, and the best part about that is that it's completely free for every single person on the planet right now at kindnesscurriculum.com. Please do not wait for adversity to strike before you engage with meaningful kindness. This is now being used by over 2,000 Australian schools and its impacts on students across the country has been absolutely profound. The most pleasing part is that, it, that is that it has allowed for connection that may not have existed prior to that experience of kindness. If loneliness is our next epidemic, then what better way to combat that than with genuine and authentic human connection and, of course, kindness. Maybe it won't save your life, but it might save the life of someone that you may not have even met yet. Because if there's one thing that every single person in this room can agree on, it's that kindness matters, and it is more important now than it has ever been before. Thank you very much.